on Monday. Uh, well, I, you know, I, 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 left, uh, I left off talking about this, this um, what should we call it, um, uh, exciting and, and dramatic uh, ambivalence that one finds in the early Eliot uh, that uh, uh, expresses itself in his relationship to literary tradition. Uh, where, on the one hand, um, he um, uh, presents himself as a, a, a uh, truly subversive and aggressive um, uh, entrant uh, into uh, literary tradition, uh, someone who's really going to shake it up and transform it, and on the other hand, uh, as someone who is a traditionalist, who is going to um, uh, speak with deference and seek, as he uses, uh, the word he uses is uh, conformity uh, with the past. Somehow both these things are going on at the same time and in relationship to each other. Uh, there's, uh, well, in, in, in Prufrock it itself uh, uh, is a poem, I think, preoccupied uh, with this kind of ambivalence uh, that I'm describing. Um, on the one hand, um, it is a, um, uh, a poem that introduces us to a speaker who lacks will uh, and who uh, seems uh, timorous and timid uh, and who hesitates before action. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he is a speaker who says to us, uh, there will be a time to murder and create, uh, as if creating and murdering uh, were, in fact, uh, in some relation um, and might go on at the same time. Uh, and in fact, if one does have some sense of creativity as involving a kind of uh, aggression or even murderousness, one might hesitate before it, right? Uh, these these uh, psychological uh, uh, dimensions that I'm describing um, uh, have, well, uh, Freudian and Oedipal uh, dimensions that I think are, are readily apparent. Um, how is it possible for Eliot to claim the authority of past literature uh, without, uh, at the same time, um, either destroying it or uh, utterly uh, submitting himself to it. Uh, this, this problem expresses, I think, Eliot's double relation to the past uh, and, and is expressed, as I was suggesting last time, in the ambiguous use of quotation that seems to hover between some kind of uh, mm, deferential honoring of uh, the literature of the past and something much more provocative uh, and often parodic. Uh, and you can think of the many different texts that uh, Prufrock um, alludes to and borrows, uh, w only some of which are traced in your, your footnotes. In fact, there's a, a great many more, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you, you find in, in uh, your footnotes uh, uh, that there are quotations from uh, Marvell, uh, from the Bible, from Dante, from Twelfth Night. Uh, well, there's that opening quotation uh, from, uh, from Dante, uh, from the Gospels, uh, too. Um, Prufrock's world-weariness, uh, you, know, you know, for I have known them all uh, already, known them all, uh, as uh, uh, understood in a poetic context, um, uh, this, this seems to, well, express his sense of belatedness and, and of the everything having, in some sense, been done already. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in, again, Freudian or Oedipal terms, terms that Harold Bloom would develop as a reader of Eliot in his own criticism very yeah. influentially, uh, you, can, you can put the problem uh, this way. Uh, how can Eliot come to write in the father's place without killing him uh, or being overwhelmed by him? Uh, in his confrontation with the past, neither he, Eliot, nor the past uh, must be destroyed uh, or the game's over. 
Eliot thereby swerves, you could say alternatively, uh, from each of these accept unacceptable alternatives. Uh, and that kind of uh, back and forthness you feel in Prufrock's divigations and wanderings. Uh, you um, see it uh, throughout Eliot's early career in his funny mixture of <coughs> avant-gardism and traditionalism, because he's, he's both those things. Uh, I've been describing this in psychological terms. We could also think about it in social terms, and I think it's important to do so. Uh, this, this Oedipal drama that I'm describing is also a social drama uh, in important ways. Uh, here's a question. How, how does a young American, because that's what he was, uh, how does a young American go and win a place in English literary culture, insert himself in a tradition that includes Shakespeare, Milton, Tennyson, Wor Wordsworth, insert himself not only as a member of that tradition, but as a central explainer of it uh, and, and tastemaker, which is in fact what Eliot would become. Uh, last time I pointed out that Eliot's uh, expatriation is going from the U.S. to London was a rejection not only of uh, America and Americanness, uh, but uh, in particular uh, a rejection of his father uh, and, and uh, who, who his father who died while he was abroad. Um, uh, and there was a certain amount of question about would Eliot uh, return in time to see his father before he died. Um, in, in a very short time in London, Eliot becomes more English than the English. It, it's a strange and marvelous, uh, fascinating uh, uh, development. He learns or creates a certain style of Englishness that he then goes on to teach to the English themselves. Uh, this is what uh, Williams William Carlos Williams and, 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 in fact, other uh, American writers despised about Eliot, uh, that he was the, uh, not just the Anglophile uh, that, that he was, but the, uh, um, well, the, the true uh, you know, English authority uh, that he became. Uh, he made himself, without any previous standing, any connections, really, uh, in, in London or in English culture, uh, he made himself a central cultural authority, uh, which became, in a very short time, almost synonymous with tradition itself. This is an amazing and remarkable uh, ach achievement and, and an important cultural event. The thing is that uh, the tradition that Eliot expounded was something to a large degree he invented. Uh, Eliot is not, as he is often seen, I think, uh, the defender of a social order uh, uh, that was passing away. And sometimes Yeats represents himself that way. Uh, rather, uh, Eliot is the representative of uh, a new class, uh, a, um, uh, a new class opposing itself to the traditional social authority of uh, money uh, and of blood, aristocracy, uh, makes its claim for social authority on the basis of knowledge, uh, technical knowledge and expertise above all, a kind of professional class uh, into which you too are being educated um, uh, largely through the modern university. Uh, Eliot's uh, tradition uh, that he, um, that I'm saying he invented or, or created, described, defined, uh, he made it out of the education he had received at Harvard, uh, but he also importantly made it outside of the classroom, uh, in part in the school of Ezra Pound, um, uh, who uh, you, you might remember uh, from last week, Specifically, also when he expatriates, leaves behind the Volgo, the, the, the people, uh, and uh, sees himself as entering into some kind of uh, timeless 
uh, tradition that he identifies, Pound does, with the spirits of irony and destiny. That's his, his phrase uh, to describe the great writers of the past. Eliot also um, enters this, this kind of semi-imaginary community of tradition. Uh, Eliot's sense of tradition is established uh, in part through uh, his quotations and allusions uh, in his poetry, uh, in part, and importantly, and I'll talk more about it today, through his criticism. Uh, this, this kind of tradition with which uh, Eliot allies himself, you could say, bankrolls everything he does, uh, legitimizes and authorizes, gives sanction and precedent uh, to what was Eliot's strange new poetry. Uh, Frost, do you remember, uh, he, as he says, goes to market uh, so he could stand on his own two feet? Well, uh, Eliot went to tradition uh, to establish his autonomy. Uh, and and uh, tradition allows him uh, uh, to, well, to stand apart both from the genteel audiences that uh, uh, Pound resisted that Frost in certain ways courted, uh, and also allows Eliot to stand apart from the avant-garde, uh, which he has a kind of um, ambiguous relationship to. Um, <coughs> allows him to stand apart, you could say, from the audiences of both a magazine like The Atlantic or Harper's on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, a magazine like The Little Review or Blast, even, where he did appear, uh, or, or Broom, uh, some of those magazines I showed you in the first week. Uh, Eliot's own magazine, which becomes an important vehicle for his work and his ideas and his authority and his presence in literary culture, his magazine was, and you can go back and look at, uh, look at its cover uh, in, in the images for the first week, his magazine was The Criterion. Uh, a magazine that, that had a kind of semi-official look uh, and, and represents a kind of fantasy of, uh, I think, of a kind of institutional and universal authority. Well, uh, how do you go about uh, inventing tradition? In order to do so, Eliot had to, uh, had to demonstrate that the received existing tradition was a false one. Uh, the metaphysical poets is the, the great and, and uh, peculiar, in many ways, essay in which uh, Eliot uh, undertakes this work in a very influential uh, form. And I'd like to look at it with you for a few minutes. Um, it starts in 950 at the back of your book uh, and goes to 953. Uh, this, was, this was a book review. This is one of the great book reviews in the history of English uh, uh, criticism. Uh, Eliot was reviewing uh, an anthology uh, of the metaphysical poets, uh, that is, uh, poets of uh, wit, uh, in particular of the um, largely uh, of the 17th century, uh, including um, uh, poets uh, like Dunn, um, whose uh, reputation uh, Eliot did a great deal to uh, establish in this century. <coughs> uh, in the process of reviewing this anthology, Eliot comes up with a whole uh, alternative theory uh, or alternative history of English literature. Uh, and and uh, certain key poetic uh, uh, propositions and statements. Let me just emphasize a few of them uh, for you. You'll see how, how um, uh, the account of literary history uh, and Eliot's own ideas of poetics are all kind of mixed up, uh, uh, and so you have to consider them together. On 951, uh, he has just, uh, he has quoted um, Dunn, and then he's quoted um, uh, Tennyson, uh, and, and the idea is that Dunn is good, Tennyson is bad. Now, uh, he, will, he will continue and say, the difference is not a simple difference of degree between poets. It's something that happened to the mind of England between the time of Dunn or Ler Lord Har Herbert of Charbury and the time of Tennyson and Browning. It's the difference between the intellectual poet, 
that's a good kind of poet. And the reflective poet, bad. Uh, Tennyson and Browning are poets, and they think. But they do not feel their thought as immediately as the odor of a rose. A thought to Dunn was an experience. It modified his sensibility. Uh, evidently, uh, he felt his thought as immediately, as sensually, as the odor of a rose. When a poet's mind is perfectly equipped for its work, it is constantly amalgamating disparate experience. The ordinary man's experience is chaotic, irregular, fragmentary. Maybe a quite a bit like proof rocks, you would think. Uh, <coughs> the latter falls in love or reads Spinoza. <laughs> and these two experiences have nothing to do with each other or with the noise of the typewriter or the smell of cooking. In the mind of the poet, however, these experiences are constantly forming new holes. Well, uh, you, can, you can see there a little recipe for, uh, for an Auden poem, or excuse me, <laughs> well, maybe for an Auden poem, but for an Eliot poem. Uh, it's a poem about falling in love, uh, reading Spinoza and listening to the typewriter while somebody cooks something. Uh, <coughs> we may express the differences by the following theory. And, and note that we. Uh, you know, El Eliot has this we that you just have to bow before when he uses it. <coughs> Uh, at, or join him, I guess. Uh, the poets of the 17th century, the successors of the dramatists of the 16th, possessed a mechanism of sensibility which could devour, and that's an interesting word, any kind of experience. They are simple, artificial, difficult, or fantastic as their predecessors were, no uh, less nor more than Dante. Uh, in the 17th century, however, a dissociation of sensibility set in from which we have never recovered. And this, uh, in, in what does he mean? He, he means thought and feeling have somehow come apart. And this dissociation, as is natural, was aggravated by the influence of the two most powerful poets of the century, Milton and Dryden. And then he goes on to complain about Milton and Dryden, and then follow the um, uh, um, uh, romantic uh, inheritance of, of Milton and Dryden in the next paragraph. Uh, he says, the sentimental age began early in the 18th century and continued. <laughs> Wouldn't you like, in your own essays, to be able to give this kind of rapid-fire summary of, of uh, literary history? The poets revolted against the ratiocinative, the descriptive. They thought and felt by fits unbalanced they reflected. In one or two passages of Shelley's Triumph of Life, in the second Hyperion of Keats, uh, there are traces of a struggle towards unification of sensibility. But Keats and Shelley died, and Tennyson and Browning ruminated. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing literary criticism. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, here, is, here is quite uh, an extraordinary uh, account of, of um, English uh, literary history. Uh, Eliot is proposing this. It's, it's quite a strange uh, and interesting claim, which for a long time, uh, I might add, uh, really was persuasive and w uh, became a kind of uh, orthodoxy uh, among um, uh, readers of, of English poetry. And that is that the metaphysical poets for centuries viewed as an anomaly in the history of English poetry uh, because of their uh, extreme intellectuality, uh, their, um, uh, their poetry of wit, um, that this anomaly in English literary tradition actually represents uh, central values uh, in literature that were lost through what Eliot views as an eccentric and aberrant tradition, which is in fact that which descends uh, from Milton uh, uh, and, and runs through the Romantics and Victorians. Uh, Samuel Johnson in the 18th century uh, uh, influentially complained of the metaphysical poets that 
Um, they yoked the most heterogeneous ideas together by violence. This is um, Johnson's phrase. In other words, they were forced and willful, and they put things together uh, in a kind of uh, violent and uh, uh, artificial way. Eliot is flipping that around, and he says, only the metaphysical poets united thought and feeling. Uh, and it's uh, these other poets that, are, uh, uh, that have been uh, deficient and, and, and uh, uh, marginal to uh, the uh, main mission of um, uh, English poetry, and that um, they are symptomatic of some derangement in the mind of England uh, that he calls a dissociation of sensibility, which somehow set in in the 17th century or so. All of this, this whole sort of uh, account of, of how English history, uh, English literary history developed, uh, all of this in this <coughs> essay suddenly, without any preparation, turns into a defense of modern poetry, uh, or you might say a defense of Eliot's uh, poetry. Uh, he says, um, without, as I say, really any preparation uh, on the bottom of 952, it is not a permanent necessity that poets should be interested in philosophy, as I was, or as I am, uh, or in any other subject. We, and there's that we again, uh, can only say that it appears likely that poets in our civilization, as it exists at present, must be difficult. Our civilization, he continues, comprehends great variety and complexity and this variety and complexity, playing upon a refined sensibility, such as mine, uh, must produce various and complex results. The poet, and now he's, he's, now he's telling, telling us what poets must do, the poet must become more and more comprehensive, more elusive, more indirect, in order to force to dislocate, if necessary, language into his meaning. And then he will go on to uh, um, quote um, uh, French poetry, modern French poetry, uh, uh, to demonstrate, as he feels it, uh, the continuity between uh, modern verse and the metaphysicals. <coughs> well, uh, here, <coughs> excuse me. Eliot is saying, first of all, uh, that the character of modern poetry, and again, for which we must read his poetry, uh, is simply a reflection of the forces playing upon it, the variety and complexity of our civilization. Uh, in that formulation, the poet seems almost passive, doesn't he? Uh, uh, and and uh, passive and um, like a kind of uh, receptor uh, that is naturally and necessarily producing the kind of strange poetry that Eliot writes. Then, uh, before that uh, idea is really uh, sunk in, Eliot gives us another view of what the poet uh, is doing. Uh, the poet uh, is not, in fact, passive, but rather he's forcing, he is dislocating language into his meaning. It's, it's such an odd phrase, to dislocate language into your meaning. Uh, it, it suggests uh, that the, the poet is not merely producing language, but moving it uh, from one place to another. Um, the question that we might ask, though, standing back uh, of the metaphysicals, is, is a question that we could ask of Eliot's poetry. That is, does this poetry that Eliot's talking about put things together or take them apart? Uh, has it, does it represent some kind of synthesis or rather some kind of uh, violent derangement? Uh, is it a mirror of a various and complex civilization? Is it, in that sense, mimetic, realist? Or is it rather expressionistic, uh, willful, uh, a kind of um, uh, subjective uh, uh, and um, 
highly personal expression in which the poet is purposefully, uh, actively dislocating and, and deforming uh, language. Uh, is it, in, in, the, in this sense, a poetry that is a, a, a kind of necessary and inevitable expression of the age? Or uh, is it perverse and eccentric, uh, an arbitrary assertion of authorial will? Uh, these, are, these are questions that um, uh, Eliot's own work, as I say, raises uh, and that, that um, are part of the history of his reception. Uh, Eliot, in his account of uh, the metaphysicals and then in uh, his defense of his own uh, kind of poetry, uh, seems, I think, to equivocate to a degree between uh, these alternatives. Uh, equivocation is, again, the key rhetoric uh, of Prufrock uh, and, and of Eliot's early uh, poetry, um, uh, of Prufrock's temporizing and his delays and his going back and forth. Let me say just a couple more things about Prufrock in the light of uh, what I've just been quoting from you, uh, quoting for you from um, the metaphysical poets. Uh, Prufrock has a kind of ambiguous relation to the past, uh, and specifically to uh, the past of English Romanticism. Uh, the poem is simultaneously a deconstruction and critique of the romantic ideals and values of uh, originality, of expressiveness, and uh, it is also a highly original and expressive reworking of those ideals. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of anti-romantic poem that is an extension of Romanticism. Unlike the conventional love song, this one comes from the head rather than the heart. Uh, or uh, you could say, really from that opening quotation from Dante on, it comes from, comes out of many other texts. Uh, I think there, there's a kind of suggestion or, or implication in the poem that um, uh, what people claim is original and primary uh, is always in some sense already scripted. That consciousness, uh, the way our minds work, is linguistic, that we think and feel through language, with language, uh, and through uh, a kind of collage network of verbal associations uh, made out of texts <coughs> and phrases from uh, not only literary tradition, of course, but uh, the whole spectrum of everyday life. Uh, original speech heroic action, the will, unmediated desire. These ideals are all rejected in, in Prufrock, uh, parodied, uh, subjected to irony, discontinuity. They're seen as romantic illusions, uh, cliches. But the poem is not merely a parody of them, or maybe through parody it does something else. It is, of course, in its own way, uh, quite as daring and disturbing a poem, disturbing to the universe of poetry, at least, uh, as any, uh, as any modern poem. Uh, <coughs> and I think you can see it as, in effect, a new kind of love song, uh, one in which the withdrawing of desire from uh, an object, our, our consciousness of our own desires, subject them to reflection, but at the same time sustain them uh, and, and revoice them through reflection. You could say that what the poem does is to 
intellectualize longing. And uh, behind that, it makes of the modern skeptic and intellectual a new kind of romantic hero. What does Prufrock want, ultimately? Uh, what does he mean when he says, no, that's not what I meant at all? Well, it's hard to say exactly, uh, but the poem does uh, conclude, uh, and as it does, it gives us a kind of answer, I think. Uh, why don't we look at the end of it? That's um, 466. <coughs> I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. You see, he, here, uh, Prufrock has moved into these rhyming tercets. He says, uh, quite simply and definitively, I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. And as he describes this, there is a kind of heightening of conventional uh, lyric language with that alliteration and with those images. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. It's hard to uh, interpret, I think, the, the end of this poem precisely. Uh, I think that uh, Prufrock has really no clarified, no specified desire, except maybe to hear the mermaids. I do not think that they will sing to me. I want them to, <laughs> he seems to be saying. Uh, in a sense, I think you could say he wants romantic singing. He wants to hear it. Perhaps he wants to be able to join in it himself, which is a wish for lyric inspiration, isn't it? Uh, he doesn't want to make love to these mermaids. Uh, he wants to hear them. Uh, he wants to linger with them, to have access to their element, uh, and to that extent to be among them and even like them. Uh, it is a wish for specifically freedom from human voices, which I, I take to be the endless overheard inner voices uh, in which the quoted repetitive speech that makes up his consciousness consists. And in this sense, uh, it's a wish for uh, uh, a renewal of romantic uh, enchantment, which he knows is impossible, uh, and which he also knows, I think, is uh, a wish as old as Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. And this is a poem, ultimately, very much in that Keatsian tradition. The Wasteland. Let's begin at the end. Let's begin at the end on page 486. <coughs> the Wasteland is a poem that, that comes in five parts. <coughs> The uh, fifth section, I think it's the longest, uh, is called What the Thunder Said. It reaches a kind of climax when, when the poem uh, renders the voice of the thunder. In the landscape of the wasteland, we are waiting for water. We're waiting for everything that water would represent. And uh, thunder <laughs> promises that, uh, that water. Um, 
And um, it also, importantly, represents a kind of speech, a speech that comes out of nature, something that the thunder says, has all kinds of uh, mythological resonance. Uh, you might even view as um, the voice of myth itself uh, here able to uh, be given uh, a voice and a hearing uh, in the poem. What the thunder says is da, da, uh, primary syllable. Uh, there is uh, a note um, uh, uh, explaining this um, coming to us um, from your editor and from Eliot. Uh, it is the uh, first phoneme that uh, becomes part of the uh, instruction, the series of instructions, data diadvam damyata, uh, translated as give, sympathize, control. Uh, what the th when the thunder speaks, this is what it has to say. It gives us these instructions. Um, on 410, I'll, I'll just focus on one of these imperatives. Da, diadvam. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall ethereal rumors revive for a moment a broken Coriolanus. Da, damiata. And then the boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm, your heart, and there's this interesting switch of tense, would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. Well, diadvam is uh, translated here uh, as sympathize. Uh, the poem is in many ways concerned with sympathy as a central value, uh, a central action in human life. And the lines that, that they introduce describe the condition that sympathy would redress or, or enter into uh, in a, some kind of <coughs> healing way. Uh, I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. Well, Eliot, uh, when he produced not the first version of this poem in uh, uh, the Criterion, um, his own magazine where it, where it first was published, but rather uh, when it appeared uh, in the United States, added footnotes, uh, or rather endnotes to the poem. and. Um, the end notes we have here are, are worth um, uh, contemplating. Uh, in a sense, Eliot's notes are, are a kind of extension of the poem, part of the poem. Uh, these lines bear the note uh, four, uh, and below I heard them nailing shut the door of the horrible tower. The speaker of those lines that Eliot is an, uh, alluding to, half quoting, uh, is Dante's Count Ugolino in the 33rd canto of the in Inferno. Uh, the traitor Ugolino tells Dante that his enemies imprisoned him and his children in a tower to die of starvation. And, and of course, Ugolino would eat his children. Uh, Eliot continues. He gives, us, he gives us that little fragment from Dante, and then he says, also, F. H. Bradley, Appearance and Reality, page 346. It's, it, when, when he writes like that, it's like wearing that uh, waistcoat. <coughs> uh, it's a kind of pose. <coughs> uh, 
uh, in this case, the pose of a scholar pedant. <coughs> Bradley says, my external sensations are no less private to myself than are my thoughts or my feelings. In either case, my experience falls within my own circle, a circle closed on the outside. And with all its elements alike, every sphere is opaque to the others which surround it. In brief, regarded as an existence which appears in a soul, the whole world for each is peculiar and private to that soul. Eliot uh, uh, worked on Bradley uh, for his uh, uh, thesis. The whole world for each is peculiar and private to that soul. Well, <coughs> uh, I don't know that there is any key to the wasteland, but if there is a key to the wasteland, it's this key in these lines uh, which lead us to Bradley and Bradley's view of what consciousness is like. Consciousness uh, is a condition um, in which we are locked into our own, I think, linguistic representations of reality without um, a, uh, uh, a common language to share them. Uh, how can a common world be created out of radically private experience? Well, uh, this is, I think, the, the central question that uh, the wasteland is, is meditating on, uh, responding to. Uh, it, it's one of the central questions in modern poetry. Let's, um, we won't get too far in, in the poem today. We'll have to conclude our discussion uh, on Monday. But uh, let's, let's look at the beginning together to um, simply to recall how this poetry operates uh, and, and make some preliminary observations. Uh, this section, the first section, is called The Burial of the Dead uh, and refers to uh, the uh, uh, ritual um, in uh, the Anglican uh, Church uh, as, as described in the Book of Common Prayer. Um, <coughs> excuse me. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Sternbergers A. With a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russen, stammlos Litauen, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. It's extraordinary poetry. And one of the uh, ways in which it is extraordinary is the um, modulations. And where do, we, where do we pinpoint the turning points between the initial vatic general voice of the poem, and then that extremely uh, personalized uh, first person, uh, who will be Marie, named uh, uh, that way uh, through that memory. Um, uh, how do we get from April is the cruelest month to I read much of the night and go south in the winter? Somehow. Um, there are a variety, uh, I think, a range of voices um, uh, here, uh, and how Eliot moves from the one to the other is a question for us as readers. I think it also raises, uh, again, this sort of central problem that the poem is concerned, and that is, what is the, 
relationship? How do we articulate the relationship between uh, the general and the particular, between um, uh, experience that is generalizable and that which is uh, almost irreducibly private? <coughs> uh, April is the cruelest month, uh, those uh, wonderful lines we all know. Uh, well, um, the poem begins with uh, illusion that it hardly even needs to press to uh, Juan de April with his Shora Sota, the first line of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, it ev evokes two, uh, probably uh, uh, Whitman's uh, uh, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, another April elegy. Um, <coughs> The poem begins by talking about the pain of awakened desire, uh, begins talking about the risk that uh, the risk that comes with beginning and desiring, proof rocks themes. Here they are, writ large. Uh, desire, it seems, is painful because it breaks things open that are closed and shut. <coughs> Uh, it's also, it seems, unsatisfiable. All of these are, to a degree, conventional romantic topoi motifs. Where exactly does the poem uh, uh, modulate into personal memory? Well, maybe somewhere uh, in that, that uh, eighth line, Summer surprised us. Uh, <coughs> it, it starts out, uh, looking and feeling a lot like winter kept us warm, uh, but uh, now uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, memory will become highly particularized through quotation, incidentally, uh, as your, your um, um, note will explain. Um, the poem really moves into a kind of opaque set of uh, personal associations. Uh, when we were children, staying at the Archduke's and so on, he took me out on a sled. Uh, these, these associations are meaningful and resonant and representative, uh, I think, to the extent that they have a generic quality. That is, uh, it's not so much that they are our memories, but they're like memories. They're like personal memories. And they're like personal memories in their uh, in their very, um, uh, the difficulty of translating and sharing them. Uh, there's, there's a kind of, uh, Marie uh, has a kind of exemplary privacy uh, about her and her uh, memories uh, and her sense of uh, frustrate, frustrated desire and longing. Um, there is, um, more that's important about this first of the wasteland speakers, uh, the um, well, Bingar Kain uh is is uh, translated for us uh, down below as I'm not a Russian woman at all. I come from Lithuania, therefore a true German. Uh, the uh, this uh, who is whoever is saying that exactly, whether it's Marie or someone else, uh, seems to be speaking uh, of a kind of. Um, uh, hybrid identity, a kind of uh, uh, mongrel or deracinated uh, identity. Uh, the condition of locked in sensibility and, and uh, um, uh, difficult uh, private uh, emotion uh, is, from the very beginning of the poem, associated with metropolitan culture, uh, culture where uh, there are many languages, uh, speakers from many places, uh, and, well, to the, um, uh, a, a culture where there are, as it were, uh, a kind of cacophony of languages, uh, untranslated, uh, existing and competing side by side. This is, uh, a kind of linguistic environment um, that uh, the wasteland is made out of uh, and is also in many ways about uh, and is the, the, the real medium uh, of uh, experience in the poem. Well, uh, let me stop here and uh, we'll go on 
trying to uh, make sense of uh, uh, this great modern poem on Monday. <laughs>